Hi, I'm Bob Costanza, and uh, along with Ida Kubishevsky, Sherilyn Anderson, and Paul Sutton, uh, we're going to present uh, a slideshow here on the future of ecosystem services scenario analysis at the global and national scales. Let's start with a refresher about what ecosystem services are. They're the benefits that people derive from functioning ecosystems, uh, but they, in order for those benefits to occur, requires that uh, there's an interaction between our natural capital assets, that's everything in the world that we don't have to produce and maintain, all the gifts of nature, and our built human and social capital assets. So all of these things have to interact in order to produce sustainable well-being. Ecosystem services are the, the relative contribution then of natural capital in that interaction to sustainable well-being. Valuation of those services is about assessing that relative contribution. And this is very different from conventional approaches that really don't pay enough attention to those contributions, especially from natural and social capital. It's certainly difficult to assess those contributions, uh, but we know that uh, they are substantial. In 1997, we did a, uh, a meta-analysis where we tried to uh, estimate with a capital E uh, the total contribution of, of uh, 17 different ecosystem services across 16 different biomes. And we came up with a, a number, you know, in the order of 16 to 54 trillion dollars a year, with an average of about 33 trillion. That was significantly larger than global GDP at the time. Uh, one thing that we, uh, that, we, that we didn't control was what they put on the cover of this, this journal. They said pricing the planet. What we really meant was valuing the planet. Uh, as the first slide showed, it's really the relative contribution of, of uh, natural capital to an ecosystem services to, uh, to human well-being. It's not about market prices. It's not about exchanging these things in, in markets. It's really about um, what, what those benefits are outside, generally outside the, uh, the market allocation mechanism. We know also that when you convert uh, intact ecosystems to um, uh, sort of more human-dominated systems, these days anyway, uh, there's, there's going to be a loss in the total value of these ecosystem services. Uh, this is a graph from the Millennium Assessment that shows, you know, as you uh, <clears throat> convert intact wetlands, for example, to intensive farming, there's a loss of more than half of the, the total value of all of those services. You know, private Private benefits may uh, may increase, but the social benefits are really decreased by by quite a lot. We did a study back in 2002 that tried to estimate um, the, the benefit cost ratio of of um, investing in uh, natural capital and preserving and restoring natural capital assets and the ecosystem services they provide. Um, the scenario we used was uh, you know at a global scale to expand the reserve network to cover. 15% of the terrestrial biosphere and 30% of the marine biosphere. That would that would cost, we estimated, about $45 billion a year to build and maintain. But the benefits, the net value, the difference between the intact ecosystem and what it might be converted to was on the order of four to five trillion dollars a year. So a benefit cost ratio of a hundred to one. It's a really good investment these days, and I challenge you to find a better investment, but most of the benefits are, are, uh, are social benefits, not private benefits. Recently, we estimated the, the change in value uh, from 1997 to 2011 uh, due to land use change uh, during that period. And we used some uh, new unit values that have been uh, collected as part of the TEEB study, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. Um, and we used recent land use assessments and land use change assessments that, uh, that Paul Sutton and Sherilyn Anderson worked on for us. And um, we came up with an estimate uh, that over that, that time period, uh, we've lost somewhere in the order of 4 to $20 trillion a year in terms of the value of those services, largely because of the way land use has changed. These are, the, these are a bit of the details of how that analysis was done. You can see the first three columns there. are Well, the first column are, is a list of the biomes. Uh, the next three columns are the area of those biomes globally in 1997 and in 2011, and then the change between those two periods with the, the green numbers being areas that have increased and the red numbers areas that have gone down. Um, and you can see that uh, the, the more valuable ecosystems, uh, coral reefs, for example, and tropical forests and, uh, 
and wetlands and uh, have decreased, um, whereas some of the le less valuable ecosystems, grasslands, um, deserts, um, <clears throat> cropland, etc., have have increased. Uh, the next three columns is are the unit values that were estimated in 1997, and then the updated unit values in 2011, and then the the differences between those two years. Again, almost all of them has gone up as we learned more about the value of these ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> and then the next four columns uh, have to do with decomposing how those changes affect. Uh, the total value. The first column is in the values in 1997, updated to the uh, to 2010 dollars. Uh, the the next three column, the second column, column B, is the uh, what if if we changed only the unit values and we updated those unit values, and you can see that the total changes from 46 to 145 trillion dollars a year. Uh, so as we suspected in 1997. Uh, our estimate of the total value would go up as we learn more about what these ecosystems are, are doing. Uh, column C then is what would happen if we changed only the area and not the unit values. And by that estimate, it would have gone down from 46 to 41.6 uh, trillion dollars a year uh, because of those land use changes. As we said, the, the uh, less valuable ecosystems are increasing and the more valuable ones are decreasing. And the final column is if we change both, we get $124 trillion a year. <clears throat> and then column E and F are the differences, respectively, between uh, columns uh, uh, A and C and columns D and B. Uh, I think probably the last column is the, the better estimate, the $20 trillion a year of lost ecosystem services due to land use change and incorporating what we know about the updated unit values. This is a global map of those unit values based on land use in, uh, in 2011 and the unit values, uh, the, the updated unit values as well. And you can see how, how the uh, production of these ecosystem services is distributed uh, roughly around the planet with the tropical forests, coral reefs, wetlands, etc., being the, the highest valued uh, systems. As part of the ELD project, we're taking this down to the, uh, the national scale and regional scale. Uh, this is just one example for uh, for Kenya, where you see on the the left uh, the land cover data that we same land cover data we used in the uh, the global assessment. Um, in the middle, you can see the ecosystem service value that we calculated from that based on the uh, 2011 unit values, and then on the the last slide we have an estimate of the land degradation, and we calculated this as the uh, percent of potential net primary production. Uh, so we can measure uh, the, the uh, potential uh, net primary production, knowing the, the vegetation zones and climate zones in the, uh, in the system, and then we can measure from ABHRR data uh, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the actual net primary production, and the difference between the two is what you, what you see here. So what we want to understand is, going forward, um, what different assumptions um, and different scenarios um, imply about uh, the value of, of land, um, both both the, um, the marketed value, but also the value of ecosystem services. Uh, so this process is sometimes called scenario planning. Um, how do we, we can't predict the future, but we can, we can look at what some of the uh, plausible futures are and then begin to assess uh, what the relative values of those, those futures might be. Uh, so it's based on these four assumptions. The future is not like the past, and it's shaped by our choices. It can't be foreseen, but exploring possible futures can inform present decisions. There are many possible futures, and then what we're trying to map is the, the possibility space. And this involves both rational analysis and, uh, and creative thinking. So we want to know if we pursue the business as usual sort of scenario and continue to degrade the land as we have in the past, what would that imply? for the value of ecosystem services and, and other um, products from the, from the land, uh, but also what are some alternative management um, assumptions that we, can, that we can make and policies that we could make and what would, that, what would that mean? And that will help us to think about the kind of future that we really want. There's been a lot of scenario planning work done around the world. Um, this, is, this table just uh, lists uh, some of the maybe uh, better known ones. Um, one of the, the uh, most famous ones is this, this uh, process that was done in South Africa in the immediate uh, post-apartheid period uh, at Montfleur. 
Um, <clears throat> the uh, IPCC has also used scenario planning uh, quite a lot in their uh, emission scenarios. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment had a whole large chapter on um, uh, scenario planning and what that meant for uh, ecosystem services. Um, what we'll be focusing on here is uh, the Great Transition Initiative and the work that they've done at the global scale. Um, one of the reasons is that they've done uh, some very detailed work about what these scenarios might look like, incl including what the um, uh, land use characteristics of each scenario are. Uh, and you can see those four, the four scenarios that, um, that they used. Uh, <clears throat> that's uh, starting on the right side. Uh, Fortress World is sort of the least desirable situation where things really do uh, tend to collapse. Market forces is sort of the business as usual scenario. Policy reform is, is um, government action. Uh, increasing the great transition is the, the more uh, sustainability oriented scenario. This is a more detailed explanation of each of those uh, four scenarios. And uh, you can read over this at your leisure, but I would encourage you to go to the GTI website, uh, which has a fairly elaborate uh, description of what all of these scenarios mean. Um, <clears throat> so. Again, market forces is sort of the business as usual one, uh, the, uh, uh, and the great transition at the other extreme is the uh, uh, more su uh, sustainability-oriented uh, <clears throat> uh, scenario that includes new socioeconomic arrangements and fundamental changes in, in values, and the one that would uh, encourage more restoration and, uh, and protection of ecosystems and their services. Actually, for our purposes, we used a, a combination of those uh, great transition initiative scenarios and the ones that were created by Ian Bateman and colleagues and their uh, study of uh, land use in the United Kingdom uh, that came out in this paper in Science uh, in 2013. Uh, they used these six different scenarios again, you know, um, along similar lines, uh, go with the flow is kind of the uh, <clears throat> business as usual. Um, the uh, nature at work and green and pleasant land are the more uh, sustainability-oriented uh, scenarios that put more emphasis on ecosystem services. And the final set of scenarios that we included were these scenarios that we did recently for Australia um, that um, is trying to get at uh, how do we uh, not only create the scenarios, but how do we get them out there for public opinion surveys, get the, uh, the general public to start thinking about what the possibilities are for the future and, and to, to rank their preferences and, uh, for these different futures. And we came up with these four scenarios, again mapping fairly closely with the great transition ones. Uh, the, uh, the fundamental axes here are whether uh, in the future we worry more about individuals or more about community, uh, and on the vertical axis whether uh, we can overcome the, uh, the fundamental limits and continue GDP growth or whether the limits are binding and GDP growth becomes no longer possible or, or desirable. And you can see it makes those four, uh, four scenarios uh, ranging from uh, free enterprise to sort of business as usual uh, <clears throat> to coordinated action. This would map onto the policy reform uh, scenario of the Great Transition in Initiative. Community well-being is more the great transition uh, scenario. So here's sort of our summary scenarios that combine those, those, uh, those three. Uh, <clears throat> market forces, free enterprise, to great transition, community well-being, and the other two, the other two axes, uh, policy reform and, uh, and fortress world slash strong individualism. So these four scenarios then we want to try to evaluate in terms of what they mean uh, going forward for, uh, for land use, for uh, ecosystem services, and for a range of other characteristics. The slide just shows uh, some of that sort of output from the Great Transition Initiative website. And you can see they have a whole range of different variables that they um, project into the future out to the year 2100 for population, GDP, uh, equity, uh, energy, hunger, water use, uh, you know, forest area, etc. This slide shows those four scenarios and some of the variables that, uh, that we're looking at going forward. Uh, so you can see the first two columns are the uh, 1997 and 2011, where we have 
population, both urban and rural, uh, the uh, inequality index, and then the urban cropland, forest, grass, rangeland, and, and desert, uh, desert areas going forward, uh, or, or the, uh, the data from those two years from our previous studies. Um, and then the four different scenarios that we talked about, <coughs> um, uh, market forces, fortress world, policy reform, and great transition, and what that means for all of those, uh, those variables. Um, but especially for the, um, the land use variables. And you can see that in, for urban land, for example, uh, the um, fortress world has the largest increase in, uh, in urban land. The, uh, uh, the Great Transition has the smallest increase in, ur in urban land, uh, and likewise for some of the other land uses. This slide just puts those land use changes into the same uh, format and for the same um, land use types as we used in our 1997 study and the 2011 update. And we're looking at scenarios out to the year uh, 2050 in this case. Uh, so you can see again the, the, um, the numbers in red are land areas that go down, the ones in green are land areas that go up. Um, and maybe it's easier to see these, these changes on the next series of slides which show graphs of land use change uh, for each of the major land use types uh, starting in 1997 through 2011 and then out to 2050 for each of those scenarios. This, for example, this is a uh, coral reef area. Uh, you can see that the Great Transition uh, restores coral reefs uh, back approximately to their, um, <clears throat> uh, not quite their 1997 level, but, uh, uh, but better than the situation in 2011. Policy reform maintains them, and uh, market forces in fortress world uh, both allow the, the continued deterioration of, of coral reefs in the fortress world scenario. They'd be completely gone by the year 2050. This is the plot for uh, forest area. Again, the same, same sort of relative uh, uh, transitions uh, with the Great Transition Initiative um, scenarios restoring forests, uh, fortress world, and, uh, and market forces continuing to, to uh, deplete forests. This is the plot for grassland and rangeland. This is the plot for wetland area. Uh, here you see you know, significant efforts to restore wetlands globally in the Great Transition scenario. Um, again, the market forces in fortress world continuing to deplete wetlands and policy reform uh, doing some recovery, but not quite as, as significant as the Great Transition. On the other hand, desert area goes up significantly in market forces and, uh, and the fortress world scenarios as desertification is allowed to continue. Um, the Great Transition gets a handle on desertification and begins to reverse that trend as well. Um, policy reform um, uh, reduces the rate of increase of, of deserts. Urban area goes up in, in all cases, but much more rapidly in fortress world, uh, followed by market forces, followed by policy reform, followed by the great transition. And finally, cropland uh, area. Um, you can see the, the changes don't look significant here, but the, the units are quite large. Uh, so in this case, um, the fortress world again has the largest increase in, um, in crop area, uh, where the, uh, the great, great transition is, the, uh, is somewhere in the middle. So what does this mean for the value of ecosystem services in each of those, these scenarios? This, this graph shows the unit values in 2011 in the first column. Um, and then the scenarios to 2050. In this case, we assume that the unit values are not going to change. Uh, that's, that's one assumption. So these are all the same as the 2011 values. And then on the right side, we see the, uh, the annual flow values that that implies uh, based on uh, those land use changes in 1997, in 2011, and then for each of the four scenarios that we're talking about. So with no changes in unit values, you can see that the uh, market forces uh, scenario, well, the fortress world, the second one there, is the, uh, has the, the lowest value for ecosystem services, followed by market forces, followed by policy reform. And finally, the great transition has the, uh, the highest value, not quite back to the 1997 values, but, but uh, approaching them. Of course, we know those unit values are going to change, and one of the big 
changes uh, hopefully will be in, in agriculture. Um, this slide just so, shows uh, four basic types of agricultural management you could think of. Conventional agricultural management with uh, you know uh, high use of inputs, pesticides and, and fertilizers and, uh, and machines. Uh, uh, the second one is low input agriculture uh, where those inputs are, are limited uh, but otherwise similar. Uh, the third one is organic agriculture, uh, where there's an attempt to, to really limit inputs, but also to have high levels of output. And finally, what we're calling ODASA, or Optimally Diverse and Sustainable Agroecosystems, kind of a step beyond uh, organic, uh, where we try to, to really focus not just on crop production, but also on the production of uh, the whole range of, of ecosystem services from, uh, from cropland. So those four types of management schemes would yield different unit values in terms of the production of, of ecosystem services, and um, and uh, we'd like to estimate what those changes might be in our in our scenarios. So we're still working on this, but uh, this is one uh, attempt where we say that uh, in general the uh, market forces. Um, uh, scenario would lead to a reduction, a, an overall reduction in the unit values for uh, for all ecosystems uh, by about 10%. Uh, the fortress world scenario would lead to a reduction of about 20% across the board. Policy reform would maintain the same levels of unit values, and the great transition would have an increase in unit values of about 20%. Uh, if we apply those assumptions, um, then we get a set of future flow values in those scenarios to 2050 that looks something like this. Uh, so it tends to accentuate uh, the differences, uh, if you will, um, and it gives us sort of a range uh, to, to work from. In this case, uh, Fortress World would be down to $73 trillion a year in ecosystem services, market forces 88. Uh, policy reform uh, would, would recover back to the, uh, or would maintain the 2011 level plus a little bit. And the Great Transition would, in fact, be better than the situation in 1997 and would be the beginning of a real restoration and recovery of the value of ecosystem services uh, in, in, uh, in all of these systems. This is what those services would look like projected out for each of the scenarios uh, under, those, uh, under those changed unit values, as I just described, with the Great Transition um, making a real recovery of the value of those services, policy reform, maintaining and slightly increasing and market forces in fortress world allowing the, the depletion even further. This graph just shows what difference it would make to those projections if we allowed the inner values to stay the same or if we uh, used the projected uh, percentage, rough percentage changes that we were looking at. You can see the the top one that, that uh, the great transition, uh, <clears throat> the uh, if we if we don't change the unit values, there'd be you know a reduction down to the dotted line from the solid line on the on the top there, and likewise for uh, for the others. So it, it tends to accentuate the uh, uh, the changes if we allow the unit values to change. And how much they're going to change, uh, we're still we're still working on that. But I think our rough percentages give you some idea of what the, the the possibilities are, and that's what scenarios are about anyway. What are some some plausible futures? We think this is uh, this gives us some something to work with. This slide just compares the um, those ecosystem service values with GDP for the different uh, different scenarios. You can see that market forces has the highest uh, GDP at the in the year 2050, uh, Fortress World the lowest, Great Transition the second from the uh, from the bottom there, but um, the changes in ecosystem service values are, are much more significant than the changes in GDP under those different scenarios. Since the ecosystem services are denominated in, in dollars, we can compare them directly with, with GDP. And this, this is what happens if you add the ecosystem services to GDP for each of those scenarios. You can see that there's an increase in all cases, but the, the Great Transition has a much larger increase in the, the, uh, the value, even though GDP may not be increasing as fast. Uh, if you add the, the restoration of those ecosystems uh, to this, we're seeing that the total value of the, the global system uh, is going up by significantly more uh, in the Great Transi Transition Initiative than in any of the other scenarios. Our work on the ELD project um, has also looked into uh, 
uh, summarizing uh, the, uh, the methods, the data, the models that have been used uh, to assess uh, the uh, ecology and economics of land degradation and restoration. We produced this report um, that, uh, that you have access to, I'm sure, and can get uh, some of the details here. Uh, this will also be coming out as a, um, a journal article in the journal Ecological Modeling. Um, so this, this looked at you know, what, what has been done and uh, to set the stage for what we want to do going forward uh, to create a tool that can really let us understand uh, what the difference that these policy uh, and management decisions can make uh, to the value of land. This, this builds on uh, previous work that we've done on uh, integrated systems modeling, whole systems modeling um, at, uh, at, at multiple scales, in this case at the global scale. We produced a, uh, a one of the first models that actually looked at the dynamics and value of ecosystem services um, at, the, at the global scale, including all four types of capital that I, that I mentioned and uh, how they interacted with each other over time. This gumbo model produces uh, quite a lot of output, has several hundred variables, and it looks at land use change, but also how that affects uh, both impacts on ecosystems and the value of the ecosystem services uh, to, uh, to society. So we look at not only GDP and conventional uh, economic production, but also the direct contribution to well-being of these, uh, of these services and how they interact with each other in this sort of complex, dynamic way. We can also model these systems in a more spatially explicit way at the, uh, the watershed scale and, and larger. And so there's been a lot of advances in uh, the ability to do this kind of integrated computer modeling that includes both natural and social systems. One interesting example is this uh, model that we did recently of the uh, ancient Maya civilization. Uh, that was a um, sort of a combination agent-based model and process-based model and uh, network uh, model that, that looked at uh, a whole range of variables, again, in a spatially explicit way, including population and forest area and ecosystem service production, uh, uh, trade networks and uh, soil and, and uh, etc. So it's a complete systems model and it's able to reproduce both the development and the eventual collapse of the, of the civilization due to the perfect storm of having overextended their trade network and overpopulation and depleting natural capital assets and then um, being hit with a, uh, a long drought uh, that they, they could then not recover from. So uh, this sort of modeling, I think, and this sort of level of sophistication that, uh, that this model shows is what we're uh, talking about being able to do at multiple scales uh, for um, to, to look at the um, uh, changes in uh, the value of land under different management regimes and, uh, and what sort of a sustainable uh, land management pattern might look like. For example, we're developing what we call MIMES, multi-scale integrated models of ecosystem services that could be uh, applied at a whole range of scales and, at and, and a range of spatial resolutions that look at this, this sort of uh, all of these variables. Uh, the, uh, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, uh, the anthroposphere, and the, the uh, and all four types of capital that I mentioned before, um, and how they interact to produce ecosystem services, but also other contributions to human well-being. And finally, we want to put a, a much more engaging uh, sort of game interface uh, on these models, where we have an underlying landscape model that's uh, more sophisticated than uh, SimCity, for example, but with a user interface that's at least that engaging. And uh, we can use this sort of system uh, for, uh, for multiple purposes, including these three uses of, uh, of games. So um, there's certainly been a lot of work um, in game theory, and exter experimental and behavioral economics, etc., and uh, on um, using games for, for research, but these are have largely been with small, uh, small populations and very, um, uh, very abstract kinds of games. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, computer games for entertainment. Uh, we we uh, we see that you know, we spend about three billion hours a week, as humanity does, uh, playing computer games. So if we can make a um, 
a landscape level game that is engaging enough and entertaining enough to get a lot of people to play it, uh, then we can use, we can get much better um, research information. We can keep track of every move that each player makes and learn how they value the different aspects of the system, how they learn uh, about the complexity of these systems. And uh, it, it also becomes an, an educational tool as well to, to inform people about what ecosystem services really are and how, how they interact with, uh, with human well-being. So ultimately, our vision for the ELD project, uh, that what we need is a, a, a tool to assess sustainable land analysis and management. Uh, and what would that tool look like? Well, it would have these, these characteristics. It would be an integrated, dynamic, spatially explicit, scalable computer simulation model, something like MIMES, uh, but one that's been developed in a participatory way and calibrated at a number of sites um, around the world. Um, the user interface would allow individual users to specify any area of the earth and be able to run a, a version of the model that could provide the dynamics and values of natural capital and ecosystem services along with the other forms of capital, built human and, uh, and social capital. So a full systems model uh, that could be parameterized with data that we have stored at the global scale uh, over the internet, and this would allow land use policy and management scenarios to be quickly run and compared using a consistent system. And this uh, gaming interface that we're talking about would allow the model to be played by a large number of people and their trade-off decisions and the valuations they imply to be accumulated and, uh, and compared. So this, this would allow the true value of land use man and management options to be assessed in a consistent and relatively inexpensive way, but in a very sophisticated way, in a credible way. And this will ultimately allow humanity to manage the Earth's land and water sustainably and well and achieve the, the ultimate goals of the, um, of the ELD project. So thanks very much for your attention, and um, some of the background material that I mentioned uh, can be made available to you on, on request. Thanks. Bye.